Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Russell Ferguson. I'm the chief curator here at the Hammer Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the museum tonight. Uh, this evening marks the first of a number of programs at the Hammer in collaboration with the Los Angeles Film Festival, which officially opens next week. We're very happy to have the Film Festival here in Westwood and to be working with the entire staff uh, and the volunteers from Film Independent. Um, please join me in welcoming the director of the Los Angeles Film Festival, Rich Radden, who will introduce tonight's guests. Thanks, Russell. I want to take a few moments and just make some announcements. Uh, I know most of you have cell phones or things that buzz. Can you take a second right now? I know we're outside, but just turn it off just for 60 minutes. Let's have nice focused conversation. Um, I also want to thank uh, the folks at the Hammer who have been phenomenal and Philbin. I don't know if most of you know, but there's a film festival in Los Angeles. It's called the LA Film Festival. It starts, all those people work for us back there. Uh, it starts next Thursday, June 22nd, and goes through July 2nd. There's 265 films from around the world that are coming into LA. It's a really well programmed, I have nothing to do with this, by the way, and curated film festival. The films are amazing. We screen music videos, a collection of uh, music videos. We're doing a whole presentation this year on Fatboy Slim. We've got uh, screenings at the Ford Amphitheater in Hollywood. Most of our screenings happen here in Westwood. So take advantage of it because there's some, and, and not only that, we have conversations, free conversations that are happening throughout the 10 days here in the courtyard. There are film schedules that are out on that table out there. Take a, che take a second, check it out. Um, it'll be well worth your, your, uh, your time and your money, I promise. It's $10 a ticket. Um, tonight we are here because three years ago we decided that we wanted to start highlighting artists that weren't necessarily in the film industry but had some sort of connection to the film industry. And mostly it was an opportunity for us to rub shoulders with people that we really respected and that we looked to as doing very creative uh, work. And that's certainly the case this year with this year's Artist in Residence. Um, please join me in welcoming, first off, our tour guide for this evening, who's also the tour guide on Metropolis of KCRW, Jason Bentley. And also, please join me in welcoming a phenomenal guy, phenomenal artist, this year's Artist in Residence, Danger Mouse. We're going we're gonna to check levels right here really quick. Check one. Hello. Got oh. it. Okay. How you doing? I'm good. <laughs> How's everybody feeling this evening? All right. Well, it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, such lovely company. Beautiful weather here in Westwood. So it's a, it's a joy to be joined by Brian Burton, Danger Mouse. Now, first of all, as, the, uh, as a chosen artist in residence for the LA Film Festival, you uh, have been asked to select three films which will be screened during the festival. Uh, which films did you pick? Uh, I picked, or the, I knew I would have to pick a, a Woody Allen film, so I picked um, Deconstructing Harry. Uh, I also picked uh, Donnie Darko uh, because they mentioned you know, the music element, something, you know, the inspiration with music and film together. So that was one I really was into more recently. And then I, I picked an, a film I'd seen a long time ago called uh, The Marriage of Maria Brown, uh, which I just recently watched again not too long ago. So I thought it would be a good, good pick. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, before we um, get into, um, you know, Brian, the film aficionado, uh, I want to discuss Danger Mouse, the super producer, and cover the music, uh, and then we'll get into film and how they 
all relate. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your success in recent years. It seems like you're on the fast track to uh, pop culture sainthood here with uh, your productions of recent. Uh, first, I want to go back to the uh, highly acclaimed and, and somewhat controversial for some uh, different reasons, the Grey album, which of course features uh, Jay-Z acapellas from the Black album and uh, Beatles, the White album. Not really a mashup, it's a highly original production. You just take elements from the Beatles and then you take the acapellas from Jay-Z. Um, how long was that project in the making in, in your own mind? Um, that project happened kind of accidentally, really. Like, I was sent the acapellas uh, for the Black Album just as a promo because uh, some people at a hip-hop website uh, knew I did remixes and things like that. And I was already doing, uh, I had just put out the Danger Mouse and Gemini record. Um, so I was signed, I was just making it by, I was doing music for Cartoon Network at the time and had a, you know, an indie record deal and things like that. So I was just getting by doing that. But then I had just recently started on a project with, uh, with MF Doom that I had just started working on and also with CeeLo. So, at that time, things were going really good, so I saw these acapellas and I was like, well, I don't really want to just give away my beats for free for these projects I was about to work on. I didn't want to give them away for a remix record, so I just kind of left the record off to the side and um, didn't really think about it. And then just one day I was cleaning up my room and was listening to the White Album and about to put that record with the rest of everything else and it just kind of hit me like, wait a minute, like maybe if I kind of I just had an idea that I was going to try something and see what would happen. I didn't think Grey Album, didn't think anything, but just maybe I would try some things and see if maybe I could kind of make an art project, really. W were you at that time, you know, back at that point, people referred to you as DJ Danger Mouse. Mm -hmm. Were you approaching it from a, a DJ frame of mind in kind of cutting up? No, that was a big mistake on my part. Basically, you know, I started making music... Uh, maybe 10 years ago and I started and I started DJing short after that kind of to, to make some money in it because playing other people's records was a lot easier to make money off of than doing your own thing. <laughs> so I kind of combined it. So basically the only reason that there was a DJ in front of Danger Mouse was because DangerMouse.com was already taken. And so <laughs> I'd never thought it would be that big of a thing and I still to this day it's like it's not really DJ Danger Mouse, it's because I don't really DJ very often. I, I like to DJ a couple of times a year here or there, but I'm, I'm, it's not really what I do. I'm just, I just ask because the whole DJ aesthetic is so much, you know, the approaching it in terms of cut-ups and... Well, it was more, it's more like, I guess, a means of, of what you can get your hands on because it's so tempting. Um, you know, you can record a synthesizer playing a piano or you can take a piano note from somebody who recorded it really, really well in the late 60s, you know, in Italy and do the same thing with it. And so it's really just, if you don't have much, you know, money or money, you know, you don't have the means to really do it, sampling and getting things from other places, that kind of, you know, the ability just can't really forget that you have the ability to do it. So, you know, you just do it every once in a while. And that was, that's really the attitude that went into it. Did, did you always see that project as underground art, or did you ever hope that it could be cleared somehow? Um, I never once thought for a second it would get cleared. Um, just I'd, All I thought when I did it was that, you know, it would be a cult underground thing that maybe some people would talk about later on that they had, or would be spreading it from time to time here or there. Like, it was just... It, you know, it had the little insert basically saying that, you know, this kind of project, like, you c wouldn't be allowed to even be, you know, released just based on copyright laws. Um, but the copyright laws were, it was not why I did it. It was after the fact when I was like, man, I did all this work and it's, you know, I had to write something about that in there, but I didn't do it because of copyright laws. I just wanted to see what, it, what, ha what would happen. Describe uh, Grey Tuesday. Grey Tuesday. I was in... I was in, I think, Las Vegas or something like that with Gemini, who I had done a record with and who now, you know, at the time, now all the tension has shifted away from 
an indie record, which is hard enough to get attention for, it's now shifted to this gray album thing, which you can't sell or do anything with. So we were there trying to do a show, and we were somebody had told me about it that some people had done this great Tuesday thing and all I thought was before after I got over the, the flattery and then realized that it w was more about probably what they were doing than about you know what I did it was much more well uh, just hoping that it had the right effect when it was done but still myself I still didn't know how I felt about it about the whole thing, but I figured I wasn't going to say anything one way or another. Um, Were you afraid you'd be at fault for the, the distribution of it? I didn't. I don't. I didn't. Yeah. No, I didn't really care. I didn't. I, at the point, at the time, I didn't have anything that they could take. I knew that sampling <laughs> and doing stuff. I, I, I had to tell it to my parents all the time. It's like you're using. So let me get this right. Like you, you took this person's music and you took that person's music. And your name is this other cartoon. What, what are you doing? And it was just like, it's like, yeah, but there's nothing to take. You know, it's just kind of like I'm doing it because I want to do it, whatever else. And at that point, when I when Great Tuesday happened, I still didn't have anything for them to take. So I was like, just might as well get it all out, get it all out before I have something. So it was fine. But I didn't I didn't know anything about the guys who did it, and I just didn't want to interfere. I didn't want to promote it or discourage it because it, you know, neither one of the Jay Z or Paul McCartney or Ringo, neither one of them did the same thing, did anything, said anything really to, you know, promote or discourage what I did. It just kind of just was there. For those unfamiliar, Grey Tuesday was, was really a grassroots uh, effort to distribute the Grey album and really, you know, uh, resist the attempts to silence the record on the part of the publishing companies. Uh, you can actually get the album pretty readily on the internet still. If you just do a quick uh, Google search, it, it's, it happens in no time. Um, I wanted to ask you what you thought um, if you watched the Grammys this most recent year and you saw Paul McCartney, Jay-Z, and it was uh, Linkin Park uh, taking the stage at the Grammys. It, it was, in a way, a manifestation of your idea in the Grey album. In a, in a way, in a way. <laughs> but not quite. I, you know... I'm glad you didn't ask me that question. You didn't tell me that question backstage because I would have said, "Don't ask it, please." I don't want. I don't. I just, you know, I didn't go to the Grammys. I didn't want to have anything to do with anything like that. So, with with, with that particular thing, you know, it, it it was what it was, and I really just didn't have any. At that point in time, I just didn't have anything to do with it anymore, really. And I honestly, I just didn't. You know, I just done the Gorillas record, so I was On more. Into, I really was. I really was. It was a little too much too a little too little too late or whatever however the saying goes you know it's just also the gorillas actually opened that show so i hear get yeah. the last laugh yeah. <laughs> yeah okay uh danger doom uh the mouse and the mask uh, collaboration with underground mc mf doom uh, featuring uh, characters from adult swim mm -hmm. on the cartoon network also talib kwali and ghostface from wu-tang um have you always been into comic books and animation? And did you see this collaboration as a way to, to draw a connection between that world and, and indie hip hop? Um, no, I think that I get, I definitely get the cartoon thing much more than it really is. It's just been a bunch of coincidences that have to do with cartoons. I mean, the first art that I remember doing was just drawing comic books, but um, that was a long time ago. and. The, the Cartoon Network thing, I was doing music for them for years, for a couple of years. That was how, kind of I, how I kind of supported myself before I had a, a record deal or anything like that. I was doing freelance music for them, uh, for the Cartoon Network, because they were in Atlanta. I was in Atlanta, and they had heard some music that I had released. And so it was, I was able to make music and make money from them. So after that, I had a continued relationship with them, and I still did. And so when me and MF Doom first got together uh, on the Prince Poe record, uh, he did a guest appearance and we worked together and I just quickly, he became my favorite rapper alive. Like he was my, just, he's just my favorite. Why, just, why do you say that? His words, I mean, I mean, that's very general, but it's, you know, he doesn't even, he doesn't rhyme like the end of a, end of a sentence with the end of a sentence. He rhymes whole sentences and his, his pop culture references and his phrasing and, and also, when I watch him work, he pays so much attention to detail. You really, when you're listening, when you finish with, a, with a, listening to a song, you've got to Google half the stuff he's saying because you don't really know what he's... You know he's got you, but you just don't really... You kinda, yeah, yeah. You get, like, half of it, the rest of it. You just, And it's just 
it's just, and he's also extremely prolific, which, you know, that's a big thing of mine. I love that people, people who can manage to put out tons and tons of stuff. So, um, so anyway, yeah, you know, we started working on this record and it was, it was set up really good because it was, uh, I was just coming off of, uh, this is before the Grey album, so I was just coming off of the Danger Mouse Gemini record and me and Gemini had continued to work, but that record was just coming out, but I had just kind of discovered Doom, if you will. So I was like, well, I want to do this record, but I didn't want to do, I wanted to kind of start down a different path. I didn't really want to do another just indie hip-hop record, really, so to speak, even though that's what it's going to still be grouped as. So... Um, he loved Adult Swim, and I did too. I had just started watching it because of my relationship with him, but he, you know, he's a TV buff, big time, so he was really into the cartoons. And when I told him he, some of the music, I, some of the beats I was playing with him, he had heard them on the Cartoon Network, and I told him, oh yeah, I worked with, you know, did some stuff with them, and he freaked out. So I was like, well, maybe you know, we can sample some of the cartoons for some of the skits or something like that. So we kind of just worked it out that way. We went to them and said, can we sample some of your skits? And then I had then it kind of hit me the idea of you know taking like the most the coolest most underground kind of MC that's basically out right now credibility wise and just kind of seeing what would happen if we did the most just silly pop thing that we could do and see what would happen and we got mixed reactions out of the whole thing and we never really told people we were approaching it that way and because we did it because we liked the cartoons and you know the people who do the shows are artists who you know are really good at what they do but it was just kind of just seeing what would happen if we did that if we went completely because they don't like when you do commercial things and it was like well what if we just you know, tv shows we can't get much more commercial than that and but we're still going to do what we do and have fun with it and see how people are going to react with it and you know like i said it was mixed but it was good overall for me you know, I realized talking to you, um, I, had, I had really prepared this in more of a chronological way, but I gathered that a lot of these projects started, you know, within a, a short period of time, uh, like a real creative period for you. Would you agree with that, or have, is it more linear? It sounds like you started uh, these things all around the same time. It's, it's, it's just never stopped, really, I guess, is what it is. It's like the more uh, chances I got, the more I just wanted to take them because it was it's all it's mainly about the people that I'm getting a chance to work with that I don't want to pass up um you know I'll just keep keep going straight through to be able to I don't really want to take a break it's like take a break or work with this person and it's just I'd rather just keep doing that keep you going, know yeah keep going. well let's cut to Gorillas. um you were nominated for a Grammy on that one um talk about the making of that record what you took away from that experience um that record happened right after the Grey album, really. Um, I had gotten a call kind of saying that Damon was interested. I think he was testing out a bunch of people, though, but you know, I found that out later. But, excuse me. <laughs> um, I went over to England and you know, met him, and I didn't know very, very much about him you know, personally. I knew Boer for sure, and I knew a little bit about the first Gorillaz record, but um, not much. And... So it, it all worked out. Uh, I went over there and I just didn't understand why, based on the Grey album, he would want me to do a, a major pop record because there was no, to me, there was no evidence in what I had already done with, with what he had heard because that's all he had heard, that I could do something like that. And I didn't know if I could do it myself. So it was just kind of a process. And, you know, lucky for both of us, we, we work extremely well together. I mean, Damon's a very... Uh, He's a very uh, critical individual. He's very, uh, very harsh at times. And musically, we have never had an argument musically about stuff. We see eye to eye on things. And he just gave me, you know, I learned a lot from him. I learned probably more than any other person musically I've learned from, from him. He just really, really gave me the freedom to kind of try anything I wanted to. And because he's such a good songwriter, um, that was the glue, really, that held it all together whenever we, I would try stuff. So. When we were doing the record, that was the main thing I, I picked up from him was a lot of songwriting techniques and kind of how it all works together. And his work ethic is insane, so it's kind of trying to match that with him. Hmm. Well, at the moment, it's all about Gnarls Barkley, uh, your collaboration with CeeLo Green from uh, Goody Mob. Uh, this record has been very well received, uh, brilliant results. 
Um, what can I say? I mean, this is a breakout. Um, did you expect this at all, or is this just a complete surprise? I mean, if we just look at Crazy, is one of those songs that just has that effect. I mean, it's so reactive with people of all ages and all backgrounds. It's something people just are drawn to immediately. Yeah, uh, yeah it seems to be. <laughs> um, we, like I said, we started this thing so long ago, and it was, it was a real simple thing. It was kind of like, you know, CeeLo was doing a remix, and after we were done, you know, the business at hand was kind of finished. I played him some music, and he wanted to use it on his record. Uh, he, was, he was doing his second solo record, and, and I kind of tried to fake him out and told him I don't really do tracks, I do albums. I only do whole albums, that's what I, you know, just to see what would happen. And he was like, all right, let's do a whole album then. And I was like, yes. <laughs> But because this was before the gray, this was before anything. I was just, you know, I, was, I grew up listening to CeeLo. I lived in Atlanta, so Goody Mob, Outkast, it was, I mean, that was the top, you know. Mm -hmm. So I went in one day, you know, and came back that same night, like, I'm doing a record with CeeLo. And didn't really tell too many people because it sounded like bullshit. And I didn't think myself that it was really going to happen. Um, but then we did a couple of tracks, and then the gray album happened, which then lifted me a little bit up to where I think... Um, you know, I had even more so to offer him on what I was going to be bringing as far as, you know, the idea of, of a collaboration was concerned. But we had started on it back then. So little by little, you know, through the gorillas, through Danger Doom, um, we were recording stuff here and there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, crazy happened at one point in the middle of the whole thing. And um, there was something, yeah, there was, there was always something really kind of special about that track. I mean, it's more than just, I think, on his part, because all I was doing was trying to kind of copy kind of like a Morricone sounding thing. And um, that was it really, it, you know, it just, it really stood out when he, once he came in and uh, did what he did over top of it. I mean, that's all, we made all the music with the Norris Barkley stuff, all the music was made first. Like I would make these, you know, kind of instrumental songs that would be really busy. And because he had such a strong voice, I knew he could kind of cut through that. So uh, I would just give him these songs and tell him, you know, if you want to rearrange it at all or do anything you want with them. But here's kind of these songs that I have that need a home or need, you know, basically need something to kind of finish it off vocally. And um, so when he did with Crazy, you know, he went in and did that in one take. He just, you know, wrote to it while we were in the studio. And um, he came back out in one take. And I think that's when we knew that, okay, other people might like this also. I guess, because we were the only ones who liked really the stuff up to that point. <laughs> you know, some of the themes on that record, I mean, uh, identity, identity crisis, just dysfunction, suicide. Um, it's interesting to me that people are, are, are so, they can identify with all of that. Um, and I wonder if it's ironic to you that such a, a personal uh, perspective can reach so many people. I mean, I, I've just heard crazy, uh, during the NBA playoffs, you know, playing in a stadium. And um, I just wondered how that grabbed you and would that change your perspective on it at all? I mean, is anything lost in translation there when all of a sudden it's, uh, it's reaching um, soccer moms? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I think that what we've tried to keep keep our, 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 uh, our attention on is what we were trying to do originally. And um, there's definitely bonuses that happen and then there's things that could be potential negatives and we try to make sure we kind of stay clear of those. So um, I, I just think that, it, that all the stuff he talks about is, I, I just would figure it would be relatable. It wasn't, you know, that's, that's how those songs, a lot of the deeper ones came about was the two of us just talking. And, you know, it's just having comfort that somebody else feels that way, too. And when we were doing the record, we didn't think it was going to be a big record. That, therefore, we, you know, you play a song like Just a Thought is talking about suicide, but you play it in front of tons of people and it's all out. It's just, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Mm. But at the same time, um, that's why it does sound... It wasn't contrived. None of the stuff we did was like, okay, let's make a song about suicide. Let's make a song about being crazy. We'll make a song about... <laughs> you know, all the different things that happened. They just were conversations that we had that turned into songs when it came time to 
for him to go in the vocal booth. So I don't know what's going to happen from here. I hope it doesn't screw up the whole thing. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. We're just kind of watching and seeing and, like I said, hoping that it doesn't mess up the original kind of people that it, that it resonated with. Sure. As we transition to uh, film, uh, I just want to touch on collaboration because in each case, you know, on the music front, collaboration is, is pretty important. Um, would you ever make a solo record or is collaboration a vital part of, of what you do? Oh, I mean, if I was ever capable of making a solo record, it, maybe. It's, every time I get ready to think about doing that, the first thing I think is, okay, well, who am I going to get on my solo record? <laughs> so it's like, that's not really, that's why I know it's not really the time to do it. Um, so right now I'm still working with people who I can learn from. And that's like, now that the more and more people who listen, the more and more afraid I am to kind of like take it on myself really. I still want to make sure I know what the hell I'm doing because I still feel like I don't a lot of times. Hmm. <laughs> now, you know, filmmaking is an incredibly complex collaborative process to bring your, uh, your vision to, to the screen. You don't have to look much further than uh, your publicity shots for Narles Barkley to realize that uh, you're a, a big fan of, of film. Uh, some of the uh, duos that you portray in your publicity shots include uh, like a couple of Droogs from A Clockwork Orange, uh, Vincent Vega and Jules Winfield from Pulp Fiction, Batman and Robin. Uh, what else have you uh, portrayed in those shots? Oh, we did, um, what else did we do? We did Napoleon Dynamite, we did Big Lebowski. Um, we, we just really look for stuff they weren't necessarily our favorite films, even though we liked a lot of them. Um, it was just, what could two guys pull off where you would know what it was and you didn't have to get props? Because we did, it, we did all those photo shoots basically the same day um, ourselves. We didn't, we, you know, it was like, if we're going to... I mean, the whole point in dressing up at the, point, at the time was that uh, the record itself mixed a lot with genres, and we had a feeling that it could get not super big, but kind of big. And... Uh, didn't really want to uh, tip off the youngsters as to what kind of shoes and chains and whatever else we were rocking really and how we dressed and where we stood because we didn't want that to really be a factor in what we were doing. So we said, well, let's just try, you know, doing these movie, movie things. That'll be kind of a silly thing to do. And we just couldn't imagine somebody else rushing us in and out of costume. So we just did them all ourselves. And then when it was time for... Uh, magazines wanting pictures, we just gave them to them, you know, instead of going and dressing up for them. You, you caused quite a sensation uh, at Coachella as your band hit the stage in a, a Wizard of Oz theme. Mm -hmm. um, so there again is another film reference. Was that your idea? It was, all the ideas are kind of just thrown out there and then, you know, when something sticks, we, we use it as best, you know, as best as we're able to. Some stuff we haven't been able to do yet, but, you, know. you must have been hot up there, though. You were, you were the uh, Tin Man and CeeLo was, was, man, uh, yeah. was the lion. Now, I know uh, CeeLo is not short on courage. Are you looking for a heart or? <laughs> no, I never, well, I guess not. No, I don't know. I just, I just said, hey, I wanted to use the little can on my head. That was it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I saw you up there, but I was feeling for you because it was, it was hot. Yeah, yeah, it was hot, but it was all right. You know, you don't really think about it till it's, till it's done. You know? So Deconstructing Harry, let's talk about this film first. Uh, why did you choose this Woody Allen film? Um, well, film, I mean, I guess I'll, I should just explain the whole... I guess people probably don't know, besides, like you said, the pictures, the film, music relation. Um, as much, but basically, you know, I started out doing music because I wanted to do film, um, but I couldn't afford the equipment to do it, and I knew it would be impossible. Like, I was inspired by film so much I wanted to, that's what inspired me to, to eventually go to music because or I couldn't get the, I, I'm, I'm very impatient, and I want to do it right then and there, and like, you know, I'll wake up one day, sometimes now, and I'm going to make a record today, the whole thing, I'm just going to record the whole thing, and then give up you know pretty quick after that but i just i want to i want to have something finished and done so quick all the time and so film it was just you know I, I had no idea same thing with music i had no idea but 
I knew music would be much cheaper. So I decided I would just do music, but I wanted to do it the way a director would do film. So that's why I, I did my kind of career or whatever, like the way I do things now. I try to do it the way a film director does, which is basically, you know, having an idea for, for the project itself and then getting who your star is and then trying to put the whole thing together and then putting it out there. And I haven't quite gotten to it being a full-fledged transition, but I'm trying to make it, like kind of create a director's role for musicians like the, in that same kind of way, like, like, like an auteur basically, with, but with music. And so when I started out doing music, that was the intent was to kind of create these kind of ideas. I could write a couple of paragraphs about this story because and then I would make this instrumental music where like hey this this is about this girl in the desert and you're like oh yeah that sounds like that but it doesn't you just it's so easy with with music especially instrumental music you can kind of really uh, make people see stuff and it's so visual a lot of stuff I do musically I try to make it very very visual for that reason so I can have these concepts these ideas there so that people could then see them afterwards so Woody Allen was one of those things where I just kind of, when I got to school, I, you, know, I took, you take your film class, you're like, oh wow, I didn't know that people like meant to do all these things or that people even do any of these things that they're doing in films. I just thought it was cool. And then you realize what goes behind it, what, what's behind it and what goes into it. And with Woody Allen, it was much more just kind of, I didn't, I, I grew up in New York in a, in a Jewish neighborhood and uh, you know, the first Woody Allen film I saw was Deconstructing Harry when I was probably 19, I guess, or like 96, so something like that. And I, you know, everybody knows who Woody Allen is, but nobody really knows knows. So then, you know, I see that, and I went and saw the rest of his other films, and there was something that I, I just didn't understand why I related to to this 60-year-old Jewish guy. I didn't understand why it was so. Like I totally understood this guy, in, in, in a lot of ways that I, I felt like I never kind of really discussed with my friends or that no, you know, the conversations he would, that would come up with him never came up with me and my friends, like, and it just was something that I understood, I thought I understood, and so the more and more I went into it, the more I understood of how he kind of did his, you know, career from the beginning and the amount of films that he had and just kind of made me feel better about myself looking at this neurotic old man, and mm -hmm. I just, you know, fell in love with, with his, with his, with his stuff, and so I picked Deconstructing Harry just mainly because it was the first film that I saw of his. Um, and I try to give that talk to friends, like, you know, it's kind of a tester, you know, give it to your friends, like, I didn't like it, I was like, I'm probably not gonna like you then, you know? <laughs> so that's, it's, it's one of my favorite ones, mainly because it was the first, first film of his that I had seen. It's really uh, well, well crafted to, um, in, in some ways, how he, uh, he used the jump cut to reflect his um, neurotic, you know, frame of mind. Right. Also, the um, the fluidity that he goes between his fictional world and the real world world characters. Um, and do you care to describe the film uh, at all? Well, I mean, when I first saw it, I guess I had just um, started taking my film classes and things like that. So yeah, there was the technical side of things that. Uh, were being shown in, in the books and things that I still never went and saw the films of his. I didn't. I just knew that he was, you know, respected in that way. But when I saw the film itself, it was pure just enjoyment. Really, it wasn't so much from the technical side of things. But yeah, looking back on it, and because you know, when I first saw it, I didn't know that 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 wasn't a character. I didn't. I, I thought it was. A, I mean, I thought it was a character. I didn't know that that was him. Like I thought he was playing this guy. I was like, this guy's a great actor. And then, <laughs> then I saw all his other films. I was like, wait, you know, well, it's kind of like, you know, Keanu Reeves or something. <laughs> I love also that touch where he's uh, inexplicably out of focus, you know, at a oh, certain yeah, yeah, point. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's trying to get his, his act together and he's actually soft. He's actually. Yeah, so how, I don't know how to talk about these films in, in ways without just talking about what's in the films. I don't know what people have seen. I don't want to like spoil certain stuff. So I'm going to do my best to kind of, I don't know what I'm going to yeah. do really. I'm just going to answer your question. Yeah, I don't want to, don't want to ruin it. Okay, how would you I, ruin well, it? I, I did, I love that movie. Um, uh, but I didn't get uh, Donnie Darko pers personally. Uh, so you're going to have to help me out very, with that A very uh, familiar answer. Uh, very, very, tell uh, me why you chose, common answer. chose that film. 
I, when I first saw Donnie Darko, I loved it mainly because it just it reminded me of an 80s movie. I loved the music. Great soundtrack. Great soundtrack. And it just it gave me a, a, a great feeling um, just overall. I didn't get it either, though. And then, I, and then I saw it again with the director's commentary, and it, and it changed everything, and then I watched it again. It's one of those movies you really have to watch over and over and over again. I mean, I guess they're showing it here once, but you have to really, really see it over. It's, it's, it's hard, because I don't, like, with that one as well, I don't really want to give it away. Um, it involves time travel and alternate universes and time space and all that kind of stuff that I had still don't really quite get <laughs> as much but it's it's a it's a fantasy story it's almost like a comic book in a way um and I'm not really a big sci-fi person at all really I'm not I mean I you know I love Star Wars like anybody else but I'm not really really a sci-fi person and this is a way of it was really like a sci-fi movie but kind of, but with the 80s feel to it and uh, it had, a, had a lot of nostalgia in it and and the characters were amazing and really it's just that it's like being able to watch a movie over and over and over again and, and get more and more things out of it um, and so if you see this I'm sure they're not going to show it with the commentary so you get you know get the DVD and watch the commentary and you really really get into it it's just kind of get a chance to geek out not that I you know need any more of that but <laughs> you, it's really that it's just a very, very, very deep movie as far as what I think he was tr trying to do, even though I, I don't think he ever really says exactly what it is he's trying to say. Yeah, I mean, he's trying to be deep, deep, definitely, but I don't know. And, and uh, you know how he leaves the message, uh, they made me do it? Who, who is they? Is that Frank? Or who, who's they? <sighs> I'm trying to see where to start with this movie because... <laughs> Like without, like I said, without giving it away, but um, from what I understand, <laughs> from what I get from all his interviews and the commentary and things like that, you know, is that, you know, the world, uh, that there was a, some kind of uh, an artifact, which is the, the plane uh, fuselage there. Yeah, the engine kind of falling off right, and right. it created an alternate universe immediately. Uh -huh. And so he's got to basically save the world from staying in that alter in that universe has to get it back on track. So he's got to do a bunch of these things, and they they're making him do. He's getting these signs from different people in the story to make him do these things to to make it right, so that the ending of the movie winds up being the ending that it is, so that it can go back to the way it, it uh -huh. should have been. So he's really a superhero, in but he doesn't know why he's doing what he's doing or what he's even doing, which is probably not sounding super exciting but it's really really good um but you have to, to kind of know what he's doing at you know like i said watching it a couple of times and knowing what he's having to do um yeah I don't know, it's it's okay. i hope that answers your question no that helps me appreciate it a little more actually okay. yeah uh the third film is a fassbender film called the marriage of maria braun yeah uh why'd you choose this one i had i had first seen this movie when i was younger much younger I think I told you before, like 14, but I think it was younger than that even. Um, and I, I, I remember seeing a movie, I didn't know what it was called, who did it, who was in it, not anything like that. And then, and then just recently, um, well, at the time I saw it, I guess I was younger, I was at a friend's house watching this movie and, um, and you know, his father was a big film fanatic and was just watching this film. He was saying we should watch. And then I remember his, mom having an argument because excuse me because uh there was nudity or something like that and so my friend you know we were both like yeah we're gonna watch it we're gonna watch it and he got really bored really quick but i stuck around for the i wanted to stick around to wait and 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 so i stayed and watched and watched and then eventually it happened and but i was still kind of wanting to watch it and i and it's it's basically a, it's, a, it's a german movie in post-war germany um taking place like in the early 50s no was it early 50s i guess yeah pretty much early 50s right after the war is over with um and it follows this uh this female lead character who basically uh does anything she can she's she's searching for her her husband um who was a soldier so she walks around kind of with this uh, uh sign on her back with his name um 
with his name on the back of uh, this, in, in big letters and a picture of him. Have you seen him? You know, everywhere she goes, she she wears this thing, and she's like, uh, and she had just like right before he was going out to war. It was strange because yeah, right as he was going to war in the beginning of the movie, he's basically uh, there's there's shells going off. It's in the middle of the war, and he's almost on the ground, like signing the marriage certificate before he, as he's leaving to the war. So she grabs it, she has this marriage certificate, and the next thing you know, she's waiting for him to come back. So it's like she's in love with this person that, how long have they even known each other or whatever, they've been married just as he left off. But she, she's so obsessed with finding him afterwards. And um, so yeah, that's, that's basically the premise of it. And it follows this woman on her way to basically kind of find him and she she'll basic she'll do anything she can to uh not only find him but but to become successful as well and start some of the capitalist things start to uh from america and and uh, start to creep into the movie and start to put her through these uh these tests really to kind of see how she handles it and she's she's very strong it's a very kind of you know it's showing where there's it's a very uh woman dominated society after the war in Germany. The men are not, are, are kind of, have the wind let out of them basically after the war and the women are having to be really, really strong. And this is all stuff I got the second time I saw the movie, not the first time. <laughs> um, and and it, was, uh, it, it was just watching this woman with nothing get all the way to where she wound up getting, which I can't really give away, but uh, watching her journey. And uh, I just remembered seeing it and being blown away when I was younger. And then recently I, I so I recommended the uh, a Criterion Collection trilogy that they thought I would like, and I saw it and was ten minutes into it, I realized this was the movie that I had never known what you know how to find, and so I watched it again and watched it again, and that was just recently, so that's why I picked that one as the third one. Now, just coming full circle, I want to ask you about your interests in film. Now that you may have an opportunity to uh, certainly more resources and connections uh, based on the success in music. Will you look to express yourself uh, through videos or concert, uh, visual, you know, aspects? Um. Um, I don't know. It's it's one of those things where I don't I don't want to uh, have any disrespect for people who've been doing this as long as I've been trying to do music, and then I start tomorrow, and all of a sudden, you know, it's okay now. You know, it's, it's one of those things where if I did decide to do it, it'd probably be another 10 years before I did something. Don't hold me to that, but I'm just <laughs> saying, like, it would be, that would be the idea, is that I would kind of get to a point where I was happy with something. But right now, I'm still trying to, you know, focus on music. I'm really just kind of trying to figure, figure the whole thing out. But I would love to do something like that, but it's just... I'd have to start from the beginning like I, like I did with music and see where, where it takes me. Will you look to um, you know, incorporate your love of film in performances? Uh, for instance, when you uh, come back here, you're performing two dates at the Avalon in late July. Mm -hmm. are, there, um, are there aspects of that performance? Like with Coachella, you, you did a Wizard of Oz theme. Mm -hmm. Do you do something else? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think that's always been the fun of it is like kind of deciding really what everybody's scrambling we don't really ever really know what's going to happen next so i, I, I want to associate vis i want to i want to kind of bring visuals into into the show uh, eventually i don't know what they're going to be yet and we're definitely going to continue to try to change our appearance on stage from time to time or every time we haven't figured that out yet either but I, I would do want to, you know, the visual element of it, you know, the music is very visual and I want people to kind of take it and have their own kind of uh, ideas with it musically. I don't ever want to kind of take people out of the dream, really. I want to kind of add to it or, you know, just anything to not really have people lose whatever is in their head when they listen to the music. Is the performance, is the stage set up much like the Coachella performance? Yeah. It's a big band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, that was... I didn't want to do it at all if we couldn't do it that way. I mean, I'd, first I thought about doing kind of like a performance art thing with all these TVs behind me, and I'm like running around smashing them or something while CeeLo's singing, and I thought, <laughs> and then I just remember having that conversation with, and the, I don't think the label or anybody really was into that. And it's just when you start selling records, it makes it kind of, 
you don't that's just you just would I just would have made a bigger ass of myself so <laughs> the more people I have on stage the more comfortable I am being up there myself so I can kind of hide up there with them would you be interested in scoring or music no. supervising or stuff um, like, you know definitely not scoring I've seen it done and no I way too impatient for 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 scoring and besides not being able to read or write music that you know <laughs> So both both of those that is nah. No. I would be into doing a, a bunch of original music that somebody would then use and incorporate into their film. Right. So basically doing what I do now and then letting somebody else decide mm -hmm. to mess with it. But no, I mean and and music supervising I, I know music supervisors and I've heard a lot and it sounds like it's a nightmare. So no. I don't know. That that'd be pretty hard to do. Sure. Yeah. Or did, were you listening to it a lot? What was the um, process? The Morricone, well, uh, he, you know, his film music is my favorite. Well, it's his his span of what he what he can do and his his output, you know, with everything he's done, he's just he's you know he's just the best. So it's it's uh, yeah, I just love the spaghetti western sound and feel of things. So. Uh, yeah, there's a sample in, in Crazy that, that I got some really cool sounds with and I was really just trying to get the feel of that. It's like this really melodramatic kind of, you know, with the female voices and, but then I wanted to try to do a different chord progression, which would be a little bit different than that. So it would be kind of juxtaposed a little bit. Uh, but then you can't even really imagine what, you can never know, you, know, you can never really guess what would happen until CeeLo did what he did over top of the music, which made it even more so. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things, Morricone, you know, you always hear Morricone is God kind of thing, you know, and it's kind of, I'm one of those people who, you know, would kind of say that, you know, if anybody is, you know. How's it going? Um, Good. So I'm a big fan of the Pelican City stuff, everything. Oh. Um, I'm just wondering what's next for you. Like I've heard about the new Rapture stuff. I mean, what what are you in the works on now? Um. Yeah, I, I did some some songs on the new Rapture record. Those are great guys. It turned out really good. I liked it. Um, did the same thing. I did some songs uh, on the new Sparkle Horse record with Mark Mark Linkus, and that turned out really good. Um, me and him are gonna work together more in the future too. Um, I did a, a new project with Damon that's we did the last this past year. We kept working after the gorillas, but I can't really go into what that is. That's kind of a secret right now. And kinda everything else is kind of a secret too, I guess, really. But that's <laughs> those are those are the things that the press have already found a way to leak, so I can just regurgitate them. Yeah, just but, quickly, what time when does the uh, follow up to uh, Ghetto Pop Life come out? Um I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know yet. We, me and Gemini and I had done a bunch of music, and uh, we're we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with it right now. Um, you know, I don't know that uh, that Gemini really needs my my name kind of sticking in the front of his anymore. So I think that you know we're trying to figure out the best way to do it. But we 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 did a bunch more music afterwards, and. Uh, you know, he's great, and I just want people to be able to hear his stuff, but I don't, I don't know exactly when that's going to happen yet either. But we did, there is music that's been done. Hello, my name's Todd. I um, wanted to say thanks for coming down here today, and also I just got hip to Norris Barkley last week on MySpace. And uh, I wanted to uh, see if you could elaborate more about um, the challenges of putting together live acts, putting the band together, and what that's like. If you have any stories about that. Yeah, I generally don't like hip hop live bands at all. Um, it doesn't sound really that good when you when you try to take uh, take something and, and turn it into live, where the drums and certain things just all sound the same on every track. Um, it's very difficult to do, and I was really skeptical. I didn't think that we were going to be able to really do it, and so that was the main challenge in how we were going to really do that without having. 13, 14 people on stage. So we just had 13, 14 people on stage and got the strings. We got all the people together really to do it. That was the only real way to do it. And so we got it. So it was really just kind of okay. Well, I was influenced by a lot of the, a lot of like late 60s psych stuff and, 
and that's the kind of sound I wanted the band to have in a way. I guess there's definitely funkadelic elements and sometimes more dramatic elements on some of the slower, heavier stuff, but um, I wanted to take each song and say, okay, well, how would this band play this song? And as long as you have CeeLo up there singing the way he does, because he sounds just like he does on the record, you're, you're going to be okay, because he's not up there rapping, which nothing wrong with rapping, but you know, I'm just saying like, it, it definitely helps to have that dynamic element of singing on top of the music when you're trying to recreate it, but it's very difficult for it to not sound kind of just bland when you're trying to recreate it. So we just have to change some of the songs completely um, to make them sound better live. Also, there's a, there's a sample quality, you know, in the foundation of the track. Mm -hmm when you listen to it on CD. Is that a challenge to reproduce live? Yeah, yeah it is because anytime you have something, um, to me, when I'm making music, one of the, one of the hardest things is, uh, and this is why I work very differently, I think, than most people. I just can't, if, if you have, if you lay down a drum beat and then you have somebody play a guitar to it, it's gonna sound like somebody's playing a guitar to the drums and you lose a certain amount of tension and, 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 and feel to it than, than if you try and make something, force something to fit. And so when we started to do it live, um, that was difficult because if everybody's playing to the thing, it just kind of tones the whole thing down. It sounds a lot more just, it can be just a lot more dull. And so it, it's, it's still difficult. We've only done three shows and we're trying to do more. We're trying to, to make it sound, you know, uh, to match that quality. But I think that given that the original elements of the song already work a little bit weird working together that even when they're reproduced live as long as they're kind of true to the parts they were on the record it still sounds a little bit kind of different i guess as a work in progress too yeah yeah we're still trying to figure it out but some some stuff definitely works better than others but as a whole we're still pretty happy with it also i wanted as a continuation of that gentleman's comment uh, on myspace and my wife had crazy as the soundtrack for her myspace page for <laughs> for a while, probably still does. Um, the internet has, has been quite a resource for you. Um, consider that Crazy was, and this was a, a landmark in the industry, was the first single to go number one in the UK based on downloads only. Mm -hmm. So there was no physical CD in stores. Simply as a download, it went number one. Mm -hmm. And then also the, you know, the, the distribution of the Grey album on the internet. It, it, it's interesting that the internet has kind of really served served you. Yeah, I I don't really, I don't know. I guess I've, I've never really treated the internet um, as a huge friend, really, personally. Um, besides for my own, you know, use like anybody else uses it. Uh, but as far as art and, and and the music and things like that, I never really embraced it that much. Um, I just had this thing, I guess, about it. I, I, I just think that we, uh, people have such, are starting to have such short attention spans and that uh, MP3s, you know, it's not so much about the legalities of it, but, you know, when we were younger and we were kids, you know, you had a tape, you got a tape, you listened to it, you bought it for a one song or whatever you got it for, but you listen to the tape and you don't really skip fast forward whatever you just you listen to it and songs that you didn't like became your favorite songs and you really got into the re into the music itself as the album as a whole and you understood it better whether you knew it or not and i think that nowadays it's kind of if you don't get it right away you just skip you skip skip or you just get the one song from the from the mp3s and that's why i'm not into downloading so much not the legalities but that is just it's just kind of it and it and people are more of a you know record labels and now even artists and are starting to respond more to that and it's just kind of you know hopefully it's not going to always be that way but that's why i never intended you know that great album was an album you know crazy there's a lot of records there's a lot of things about the song i love the song it's great if it's a means for people to get the record great but i'm i wasn't really so concerned about the the charting of a single single is it's good it'll be hopefully it'll be good for for, for younger people um who it replaces a, a different song that they would have been into that maybe would have sucked a little more or something. But <laughs> other than that, it's it's you know it's a song that's part of a much bigger thing. And I don't know. I just you know it's love hate with it with yeah. the internet because it's just, it, it's like you said if I, if it wasn't for that I don't know you know I would just I'd, I'd be doing something I guess you know. <laughs> but it, it's definitely helped a lot um, and it's going to help a lot of other people. It's just 
it's it's got a ways to go. I think I don't know. It's it's it'll handle itself. I guess it's more a, a human nature thing than the internet. It's just the way it is. You know, DJing is the same way. It's like sorry, I'm gonna go on my little rant, but DJing is just it's the same thing. You know, you're not. You know, it's it's the short attention span again. It's like you know, you hear they sell more guitar more more turntables than guitars, and it's the instant gratification that you get yeah. from playing somebody else's record and you kind of can mistake that for it being the same thing when really it's not the same thing you know you try and get in front of a crowd of people and get them to dance and entertain them on a guitar the same way you can by playing Michael Jackson it's not going to happen <laughs> so it's like it's people need to understand what they're really doing what it what it, what it really is and I think that people a lot of times mistake those things yeah culture becomes disposable yeah it's yeah Let's uh, let's bounce over here. Uh, yeah, I guess two questions. One based on the one before. So, are you doing a whole album with uh, Mark Linkus and Sparkle Horse? I'm a big fan of his. And then the, my second question, I guess, is, you know, your hip hop albums, you know, with uh, with Doom and the Gray album, and and have been called really progressive. And it seems like a lot of kind of popular rap has kind of stagnated. It seems it, it seems to me. And I was wondering, sort of, what you see are kind of the big problems kind of facing rap and hip hop today. Um, with the Mark Linkus thing, um, no, this 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 new record he's he's he finished. I did about maybe four songs with him on that. We were just getting, you know, kind of. I just I came along as he was doing it, so we did it there. But there's definitely a possibility of us doing a whole thing together after that. But that's kind of anybody I work with. There's always open chance for that. Um, and as far as hip hop, I don't know, man. It's like. I've had this discussion so many times. It's like, oh, you know, it used to be better. And it's like, not really. I mean, we used to listen to Snoop and NWA, and now it's not much different. It's like, it was, a lot of stuff is, you know, whether it's more violent, more this, more that. I, I think that part of the problem is that a lot of the stuff that we listened to coming up wasn't afraid to sample good music. And nowadays, if you're going to give me, you know, a million dollars, I'm not going to give it away to samples. I'm just going to basically get my boy to do the beats because you know, you guys are coming to hear me, and really it's, it just kind of winds up backfiring. There's not a lot of great music in the music sometimes. And then, and then yeah, you do have, I guess, a lot of, uh, you know, w whether it's subject matters or whatever, you do have a lot of uh, things that are kind of repetitive, and you have people who, if it's not broke, they figure, you know, don't, don't, don't fix it. You know, you, if you're going to, you know, you guys are gonna s still sell millions of records doing this. Then they're gonna they're gonna keep doing it. It's I don't blame them. They do what they do. It's it's not their fault. I mean, it's if they changed what they did, maybe they would sell. But it, you know, people go out and they have different they have different reasons for why what they do. And and I think that hip hop itself is it was a very organic, natural thing. And I don't think that trying to change it, it, it you know deliberately it's going to do anything it's either going to change or it's not you know it's either it's going to do whatever it's going to do yes sir um yeah we've heard a little bit about your thoughts on like music and, and movies i was wondering if there are any books or other art through like different media that have been um like influential on you or, or that you've been into lately um yeah i i, I mean i guess books i read sometimes I mean, you know, I guess when I get the chance. Um, uh, I'm trying to think the last book I read. Ooh. Um, I guess it was Russ Meyer's biography. I like biographies. So uh, things like that, I guess, as far as any kind of fiction stuff. Um, just classics, nothing that's going to, that anybody's, that, that people haven't heard of. So, you know. Yeah, I'm trying to read more. I just I need to settle down. I've been kind of busy. <laughs> yes. Hey, what's happening? What's um, up? I remember when I was younger, I used to, uh, my favorite cartoon was uh, Danger Mouse over on Nickelodeon in the late '80s, and I was just wondering how much did you actually watch that show? Because uh, I used to love that show, and uh, and also um, I have a a Danger Doom CD. I was hoping that that you could sign for me. Oh, okay. Um, the show, yeah. I mean, that was my favorite cartoon when I was younger. Um, on Nickelodeon, 
all that stuff. I guess that was Count Duckula had his own spin-off. It was yeah. it was the show, man. I mean, I don't know why because when I worked to watch it now, I still don't get a lot of the British humor in it. I still don't understand it. And I know I didn't get it when I was younger, but I just it was a cartoon, you know, eye patch, I think it was the eye patch. <laughs> it was really just simple and I when I when I picked the name, um it was a cult thing. It was like something where you know, not that many people knew what it was, and I was like, ah, uh, my favorite DJ growing up was this DJ from Atlanta named DJ Smurf. So I was like, well, if I'm gonna do a DJ thing, I'll, you know, I'll just do a cartoon, like something silly that won't be me taking myself too seriously. And so I just picked Danger Mouse and never thought it would like really stick or that anybody would, you know, it was just a thing to do. I got to draw the little characters on my little mix CDs. It was just something to do that was just different. You're like the only person I've, I know that used to watch that show, honestly. There's some, some people have seen <laughs> Anybody else here seen Danger Mouse? Ah. In England, it's huge, uh, I, I hear, you know. Yeah. But yeah, and sure, I mean, I guess I can sign you. Not, not here in front of everybody, like it's like, like some big <laughs> thing, but yeah, sure, man. So okay. I, th I think we have time for just one more question. Okay, over here. Uh, I don't know if this is like a good last question, but uh, <clears throat> not too much pressure on me, but uh, First, thank you for coming out. It's a great start to the festival, honestly. It's a, um, this is a random question, but whose idea was it to do the Star Wars theme at the MTV Movie Awards? Because that was unbelievable. So I'd really like to know who told you to do that. Um, we, you know, we did all the, the film stuff, the film themes for all, this, all the, the press pictures when we did our big original batch. And then from then on, we did some live stuff with, with uh, like The Wizard of Oz. And we did more. We had to go back and do new batches. And... Star Wars was always an obvious one to do, but never really wanted to do it unless it was going to be done like perfect because those fans will eat you alive if you screw up their Star Wars because it's like that's their whole thing. And I was like, I'm not going near Star Wars because nah, I'm not doing it. And then when we did the movie awards, uh, somebody mentioned it. And then before I could say anything, somebody else on the phone was like, oh yeah, Lucas Films, they'll give us the costumes. And it was like, you got to do it. So, so they sent their people down and, you know, they were there to dress us up and protect us from stealing the costumes. And it was great. It was like the original costumes we got to use. And, you know, I just told everybody there, like, don't do anything stupid once you're in the costume because it'll be on the Internet and then they'll hate us. So we, just, we, we did it right, though. I think it worked out. But it was the most obvious choice for something big. And, you know, to get it from Lucas Films was that's the only way I could, you know, that it, I think it could have worked out. Awesome, fantastic, you guys. Let's give it up, everyone, for Artists in Residence, Danger Mouse. Thank you. And I just want to put a plug in. These three films that Danger Mouse selected are screening at the LA Film Festival. I just talked to Richard Kelly three days ago about Donnie Darko. We're trying to get him out to the screening. So don't listen to the director's commentary. Come out, see it on the big screen, and let him explain it to you after the screening. Great, thank you. Thank you.